Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 2024 Draft Oregon Big Game Hunting Regulation Proposals Meeting. My name is Tucker Freeman. I'm the Malheur District Wildlife Biologist operating out of Ontario and covering the far southeastern county here in our state. I'd like to, as we get started, I'd like to draw your attention to the QR code at the bottom right of your screen. That's going to be your avenue for feedback to us tonight. Um, go ahead and scan, uh, use your smartphone and the camera, open up the camera app to scan that QR code. It should bring up a link you can tap with your finger to, um, that'll bring you to the website where you can enter questions, comments, concerns, which we will try to address tonight and in the, in the coming days. Um, you can also type in, pull up a web browser, type in myodfw.com and use the search function there to search 2024 big game regulations, which will bring you to that same site uh, with a link to, to where you can provide feedback to us tonight. We are covering tonight, we're gonna cover the central and southeast Oregon region, what used to be referred to as the, the high desert region. Um, the wildlife management units listed there on your screen are what we're going to talk about as far as our specific tag proposal changes and regulation changes tonight. Um, we will cover a couple statewide topics uh, here here in the introduction, but the meat and potatoes of of our of our changes and our specifics are going to be applica applicable to those units you see on your screen. If for some reason that's not what you're looking for, I'd advise you to to go back to myodfw.com, search those 2024 big game regulations, and on that site. We have recordings of prior webinars that cover different areas of the state and then any any others that are going to take place um, the rest of this week should be posted by this week if you need to look there for for an area other than this that you're looking for um, but these units comprise what are the mid columbia deschutes ochico klamath lake harney and Malheur districts we've got representatives here tonight um, to address questions and, and take us through this this presentation I'll give you a brief outline of what we're looking at for the night. Um, I'm going to take the first 10, 15 minutes, go over the, the regulation setting process. I'm going to cover a couple statewide top or statewide topics that we felt would be would be relevant at that level to everybody. Um, then we're going to break down and, and get into our specific uh, tag allocation changes and regulation changes uh, specific to this central and southeast Oregon region. Um, Greg Jackal is going to cover deer and elk. Uh, after after me, and then he's going to pass it over to John Muir for bighorn sheep, mountain goat, black bear, and pronghorn changes for the region. Um, so if at any point, again, there's the QR code on the right of your screen, Any at any point from now until we shut this thing down, you all are welcome to, to bring questions, comments, concerns to us. Uh, following kind of our preset presentation uh, with, with me, Greg, and John, that should take oh, 50, 60 minutes, uh, somewhere in that area. The rest of the time we're gonna spend in basically in a Q&A session, uh, addressing uh, feedback that we get from you throughout the night. So again, use that QR code, uh, utilize myodfw.com to get those in. Our, our PR folks are gonna be sorting those and assigning representatives throughout the night to, to try to get to you. If we don't get to them, which we probably won't get to them all tonight, um, we are committing to try to, to respond to all all of your feedback within a couple of days, uh, certainly by the end of this week, uh, if at all possible on our end. So feel free to, to send that, that feedback our way. I'll go ahead and get started with my piece here. Um, talk about the regulation setting process a little bit. Nothing's changed this year in what, uh, in what has happened in the past. Typically we run these July public meetings, which is what this is serving as. Um, we utilize those to, to, to to get feedback from from the public, um, we we then take the next couple months to review that feedback, incorporate it into our proposals, change them as necessary, get them packaged up for the for adoption by the commission in September. Uh, this year's meeting is set for September fifteenth in Bend. Um, that's where these these should go to the floor and hopefully get adopted. Um, we will so so two different types of feedback really here that we're discussing. One is coming from you all tonight, uh, which will go forward. We will put it in some sort of written format uh, to the commission prior to that meeting. Uh, if you want to, if you have a particular issue or, or question that you want to go directly to the commission with, you're welcome to utilize uh, the email address you see on your screen there. 
uh, type that up, send it over to them prior to the meeting, um, or you can show up to the meeting in person or attend virtually uh, on September 15th. We do ask if you if you are going to uh, go the virtual route that you provide 48 hours of advance notice for a sign up on that. Um, but for all intents and purposes, uh, our proposals go forth. They get adopted by by the commission in September. Um, then we've got a couple months to put the pamphlet together, get ad set, get design set, get everything printed out, and we should have uh, we should have that pamphlet out by December of this year for the upcoming 2024 hunting season. I'm going to talk about a couple statewide topics now. Um, the first couple are really just um, prior hunts that we've started or, or a regulation, a major regulation change that, that actually both of them we adopted in, in 2020 and went in place for that year. Um, at the time that we made those changes, we committed to a three-year review on them. So we're going to go ahead and provide that data. Uh, we feel like it's, it's not necessarily trend indicating, but it is three years of data and, and it is worthwhile. And we're going to Gonna gonna review that with you tonight. Um, the first is the general season animal itself damage tag. Um, I need to give a probably to, to go into this. I need to give a quick primer on elk damage uh, across the state and, and in, 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 in eastern Oregon. Um, so it's a it's it's a problem that becomes yeah. chronic and and it, it causes a lot of headache, a lot of extra hassle for for a lot of different folks. Um, basically, you have elk anywhere from from August through, depending on the winter, through you know possibly the end of March, come down from the high country, get down onto farm fields, whether they're whether their forage is drying up in the summer or whether they're getting pushed down by snow. They get into fields and, and irrigation, and they they eat crops. They get into haystacks. They trample fields, run through fences, cause a variety of problems um, that landowners have to deal with, and that landowners then have to put through. RODFW damage process is basically on an individual basis, um, year in, year out. Causes a lot of work for landowners, causes a lot of work for us as we explore, uh, do things like explore non-lethal options. Um, we document and have to close out each, each individual complaint. Um, and we oftentimes end up issuing damage tags, uh, have to follow those up on an individual basis. Um, it can be a public perception issue when you get to where you're you're killing elk in what looks to be outside of a of a normal season, and sometimes doing it, you know, in and around livestock, in and around residences, um, and 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 that type of thing. So so really, if you can reduce damage, you can you can reduce a lot of hassle with with a lot of different folks and and cure some headaches there. So that's what this hunt was really intended to do. Um, was to offer some extended seasons, four to eight month seasons um, in areas that, that experienced chronic damage and where you had some landowner buy-in to let some members of the public out out and try to try to get after and hunt some cows. Um, really, the idea is to apply that pressure over that that extended season, keep after those elk, potentially harvest a few more elk, and really really get the message across to the elk that, you know, if they spend, that's not a place they're going to want to spend a lot of time. Um, they're going to get harassed, they're going to get hunted, they're potentially going to get harvested. So um, that was really the intent of, of this of this new hunt. Uh, we've had three years data on it and you can see it's it's been successful in, in those um, as far as those 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 parameters we have reduced, you know, since it was incorporated in 2020, we've reduced the number of cow elk killed specifically on damage tags, which means we're issuing less damage tags and dealing with less damage, um, doing less work there, which is which is good. Um, we're also we're also harvesting a considerable amount more of antelope elk in those areas where you have uh, historical historical elk, elk damage. Um, so we're really accomplishing objectives with that that hunt as of right now, and and plan to keep it in place moving forward. Uh, we look we we may look to expand it on a case by case basis in areas where that aren't currently enrolled in the program, or where we get um, and where we get landowner buy in as far as, as giving some members of the public access to their lands to to address some of that damage. The other hunt concept we wanted to talk about was the inclusion of spike deer in the in the uh, Western Oregon bag limit. Uh, this happened in 2020. It happened in concert with uh, with sp the spike uh, spikes being removed from the 600 series antlerless uh, bag limit at that time. And really, the concern going into it was 
you're going to start knocking out a bunch of spike and you're going to take all the males out of your population to where you're not going to have those those larger age class deer available to harvest in the in the successive years um it's only three years of data right now but we're showing that that's not happening yes we are killing quite a few more spikes uh from 2020 on than we did before but um we're actually seeing a little bit of an increase in in killing those or in harvesting those uh, more mature deer in those larger antler point classes. So, so the plan for this is to keep it as is. As of right now, we will continue to monitor um, and we'll adapt as necessary if, if we see a deviation from this data in any significant way. But um, that's what we're seeing for the first three years of it. Now, the last statewide update we wanted to, to include um, was the mule deer plan update. Um, it's a pretty big undertaking for ODFW. Uh, something we've been putting uh, a lot of time and effort into and preparing for in, in the last five to ten years and in terms of research and extra adding personnel capacity um, two really reasons really driving it uh, one is just chronological time it's you know it's the last time it was updated was in 2003 we're now in 2023 it's probably not going to be released and finalized until 2024 so 21 years means it's it's time to time to um to make this current um and the other reason is really you know as most people on this webinar tonight know the status of mule deer has changed uh, in oregon since 2003 um, it's, it's changed in a lot of ways and it's really time to to align in writing a management plan that uh, that matches up with what we're seeing on the ground in terms of uh status or this status of the species and population trends and habitat conditions, extended drought conditions in some areas, um, as well as management strategies that we're implementing and, and looking to enact into the future for the best of mule deer. Um, so that's what we're trying to encapsulate in this revision. At this point, we've released five of 12 chapters. The plan is to have the remaining seven done by October of this year. Um, we've held a couple web informational webinars on what has been released. There will likely be a couple more coming. I would definitely encourage you all to check out the website at the bottom of the screen. That's that's your source for all things Mule Deer Plan Update in Oregon. Um, it has PDFs of the the release chapters. It has recordings of those uh, of those webinars. Variety of other information. That's also your um, that's your avenue to provide public feedback, which we've been accepting since we've released the first chapter here this winter. And we'll continue to do so until we release the last chapter for probably a couple of weeks after we release that last chapter here this fall. Um, at that point, the timeline is such that hopefully this fall we wrap up public comment and an initial draft release. Then we'll look to review those comments, incorporate them, edit the document and get it get it into a state that a more or less final state that can go before the commission um, the plan for that would be be in february to march of 2024 and hopefully it's in a state that can be adopted and and the plan could be finalized at that point i'll start to move out of the state well this is still statewide stuff um we'll start to move into some of our changes for for the 2024 season specifically uh, on your screen are are your main seasons um, set for or proposed for 2024? Uh, I just ask that you bear in mind um, that the framework for our season setting changed in 2020. Uh, at that point, we decided we would base all seasons off of the opener of of any legal weapon buck deer, which we set at the time to be the first Saturday in October. Uh, what that means is that you're not going to have the exact hard-coded, same hard-coded dates year in, year out as you had the year before. You're going to see some fluctuations of a day or two uh, between the years. Actually, in 2023, um, we've seen the biggest shift. We've seen this, it was like a six-day shift um, later than what the seasons had been in the past. That is the, the biggest. That's the latest you'll see seasons. It should start drawing or kind of um, moving back incrementally in the years to come. I think in 24, it's it's set to move back two days from what you're seeing for seasons this year. But those are the proposed season dates for, for 2024. Um, last little bit on, on statewide, the statewide impact of our 24 proposed changes compared to 23. 
Um, you look at our four species that we allocate the by far the most tags to um, deer, elk, pronghorn, and bear. There's very little change from 23 to 24. You're looking at um, you're looking at an interval of plus or minus one percent on all of those. Um, you do see a little bit more of an impact on mountain goat and bighorn. Mountain goat, you've got so few that we allocate statewide. Yeah, we're dropping two, and it's it's a nine percent difference um, from 24 to 23. Um, just just a just an artifact of having so few tags. Um, but we are adding, looking to add 24 um, to bighorn uh, tags to the bighorn hunt um, come 24. Um, really, just a just an indicator, you know, that that means that at a statewide level, we've got some herds that we feel are healthy enough to absorb some additional hunter harvest. And we want to get some people out and get get the um, get them the opportunity to do that and, and potentially benefit those herds with some additional harvest as well. So I'm hopefully going to end more or less on a good note with that. Um, I'll transfer over to our, our specific um tag allocation proposals and regulation changes. Uh, we're going to start with deer and elk and Greg Jackal, if you're ready, Greg. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Tucker. Um, so my name is Greg Jackal. I'm the district wildlife biologist here in Prineville, so Central Oregon. Um, tonight, thanks thanks everyone for joining in. Um, this is a, a really good opportunity for folks to, to provide us some good questions and and for us to provide you with information about um, kind of the status of our of our big game populations. Um, I don't I don't see the slide next uh, Tucker if you can transfer slides. Perfect. <clears throat> so I'm going to be going over the major changes to the meal deer and elk hunting tag proposals for 2024. And just as a reminder, everyone, all the districts um, have representation on this call. So if there's any like specific question that anybody has um, to tag tag numbers, population levels, or anything like that, you know, pl pl please, uh, you know, use the QR code to send in a question. Um, I think there's also a link you can you can click that link and and ship us a question. We'll have probably plenty of time at the end to to answer as many questions that come in. Um, what I wanted to start with first off is just kind of give a general overview of kind of our weather, um, our winter and our spring that we've had the last year kind of kind of precedes some of this talk. You know, we do a lot of our surveys in the in the, in the fall and winter leading up to setting tags. Um, we used to do it a year in advance. Now we're doing it kind of two years in advance. So kind of tough to look at that crystal ball. But, um, you know, this winter from the Dallas South, you know, to, to Bend and Prineville, didn't have a very tough winter. We had kind of a pretty mild winter other than a, a little bit of a snow event in November. Um, that being said, you know, Burns, Lakeview, some of them out here county, they they had the storms kind of avoid us and they they got dumped with some snow. So Burns had pretty significant snows this winter, pretty good cold temperatures. The the biologist there feels like the <clears throat> animals at least escape most of the the major um, critical time periods of, of heavy snow. It's not like we have, you know, some of the situations that were occurring in Wyoming this winter. Some of the winter ranges were still open and those animals were utilizing it. Um, pretty consistent with all the districts was a, a was a long, cold and wet spring, which is kind of what we really needed. And if you look at this, um, look at this slide, it pulled this off the U.S. Drought Monitor and basically it's a snapshot in time from last July and then to current July. Um, we're hopefully clawing our, clawing our way out of this drought condition that we've been in for the last three or more years, depending on where you're at. But if you look at, you know, Central Oregon, you know, we were in the extreme red and then most of the red in the rest of the district. So, um, you know, this spring we had water everywhere. We still have water in a lot of places in the desert. Primal Reservoir is full, Ochoco Reservoir is full. So we're hoping that this carries over in the future and that we start seeing a, a trend in, in better moisture conditions. Um, in Eastern Oregon and actually the whole state. Um, next slide, Tucker. <clears throat> so basically I'm gonna start, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with uh, mule deer and I'm basically gonna start from the kind of the top of the state and work my way south and, and basically east. And so we're gonna start in the mid Columbia district um, and I'm gonna kind of just go through 
you know, basically the major tag changes and any new hunts that were proposed. And so we're going to start there and kind of work our way south and do the same thing for elk. Um, so we'll just get started with the mopping unit. Uh, biologists there, you know, are going to propose a, a slight increase in tags from 400 to 430. Um, and that's, you know, because buck ratios in that unit have been increasing for the last five years. Um, and, and that's, and let me, let me just back up a little bit. So that's the 140, that's the any legal weapon, uh, mop and hunt, which as most people know, it's kind of the rifle season. And that's kind of what we call it. And we've kind of switched our terminology last few years ago. So whenever I say any legal weapon, that's kind of that traditional rifle season, which is that first week of October. And then I'll obviously talk about bow seasons and then we'll, we'll have some, have some discussion about some doe hunts and cow hunts when we get to elk. But but if you drop the White River, um, they haven't been at buck ratio for the last five years. So they're looking to trim tags. Um, any legal weapon, they're looking at reducing tags by 150 for the any legal weapon hunt and then 50 tags for the bow season. And that's kind of just done to kind of look at the harvest, um, kind of make it equitable amongst the harvest in that in that in those in that unit. Um, and then the hood units looking looking better population wise so we've you know kind of done a modest increase from 450 to 500 you know 50 tag increase for the any legal weapon and then um basically the 642 hood it's an antlerless hunt this is the only antlerless hunt i'm going to talk about tonight we, we're basically only recommending a very modest five tag increase to uh to an antlerless deer tag and that just kind of shows you like we're not really hunting does you know, at all in Eastern Oregon, only in very min minor places where we have, you know, kind of elk or where we have uh, agricultural damage. And so that's really the only one we're going to talk about tonight. <clears throat> so dropping down to the Ochico district, my district, um, we're proposing a tag decrease in the Ochico any legal weapon unit from um, 20,000 or 2050 to 1950. So 100 tag decrease. And then for the for both of the Ochico and the Grizzly bow tags or bow hunts, um, we're looking at reducing 100 tags there. Um, reason rationale for that: Ochico has been chronically low population. We're about 20% of MO. Um, our buck ratio is barely stable, but but our numbers of, of of deer are not there, and we're coming out of that mega drought as you can see. So we're just kind of trying to trim tags and and make it a and also our, our success rates are dipping below 20%. And so we're just trying to bring that success rate above 20% for uh, for any legal weapon um, um, rifle, uh, any legal weapon tag. <clears throat> for, for the bow hunts, we're basically just looking at the demand for those tags has not, you know, the folks may draw that second, third choice, but our harvest survey uh, results are showing that folks are just not going. And so we're kind of just trimming tags down to account for that. The next slide, Tucker. So we'll go down to the Klamath District. Um, both of their changes are looking at for the interstate unit. Um, as most on this call know, you know, the interstate unit has had multiple major fires um, recently, and hopefully interstate is not one of the fires that's burning right now near Klamath County. But um, that unit's seen over 700,000 acres of its summer range. Um, decreased by wildfire over the last four years or actually the last five years. So they're seeing, you know, um, chronically low fawns, chronic uh, fawn ratio and chronically low buck ratios to where they need, we need to see some cuts. And, and we're hopeful, um, like we see in most fire conditions on summer ranges, that that habitat restores itself to some of that um, early successional forage that is very good for deer but they just have not seen that on the ground yet. Um, the lack of moisture, uh, growing conditions have been very tough. So um, they're looking to reduce tags by 150 in any legal weapon and 70 in the archery. Um, the Lake District is proposing tag reductions in both the North Warner and the South Warner. So reducing tags by five in both of the North Warner rifle or any legal weapon and bow, bow seasons. And then uh, 30, and 15 in the South Warner. Um, you know, buck ratios in the in the Warner units are pretty good, but you know, the older age class bucks are just non-existent. And so folks are spending 17 points to to draw these tags. And so we're just kind of looking at reducing, you know, pretty pretty minor reduction to to get it a maybe a little better quality hunt for those folks that are using 
uh, 17 points. Uh, next slide, Tucker. And then finishing up with deer, <clears throat> we're going to go to Harney and, and the Malheur district, and they've actually seen, you know, a little bit more uh, positive response in some of their population surveys from mule deer. So they're looking at increasing um, uh, any legal weapon tags in most of their units. So Malheur River looking at increase. It's a modest increase of 50 tags. Uh, Trout Creek Mountains uh, increase of five. Uh, the Beulah increase of 100 and the Hawaii increase of 25. So they're seeing, you know, population response, uh, a little bit better buck ratios in those units. And um, they're also proposing a youth hunt, a couple, a couple more youth hunts that I'll talk about later. Um, so that's, that's good for deer. Next slide, Tucker. <clears throat> okay, so going back to elk and then starting from the mid sea and, and working our way south. Um, you know, mid, mid Columbia is proposing a, a 30 tag increase in, in cow tags from the White River private. They're seeing a few more damage complaints in that area. So going from 180 to 210, um, you drop down into my district and we're proposing to, oh, we're proposing to cut 25 any legal weapon uh, tags from both of the uh, Ochico uh, bull hunts, which so first season and second season. Uh, 25 in each of those, so that'll equate to 50 tags um, reduced on the Ochico. And then we're also cutting 50 archery uh, bow tags from the Ochico unit. And main reason we're doing that, um, we haven't reached bull ratio, but one year out of the last 10 uh, Ochico units, uh, it's a unit we're trying to manage for 20 bulls per 100. And so it's a little bit higher tiered uh, uh, managed elk unit. And so we just, we need to get, we need to get there. And so reducing tags, um, should help us with that. Next slide. So for the Deschutes district, uh, the proposal is to to drop or eliminate the 235A Badlands hunt. And that's actually kind of a hunt that is shared between uh, the Deschutes district and Prineville. It's kind of that uh, Pal Butte, Badlands, Al the city of Alfalfa. Used to have a fair amount of damage in some of those alf alfalfa fields. Well, last year there was zero percent success, and folks are spending you know two or three points to draw this tag. Uh, we're not seeing the damage complaints that we used to, and so we're just uh, proposing to delete the hunt. Um, we can't address those damage concerns with other ways. Uh, the Klamath District, um, going back to the interstate unit, similar to Deer, um, you know, with all those fires, you know, reducing the amount of cover. <clears throat> they're seeing some reductions in their bull ratios, and so they're looking to trim tags from 250 to 200, just to you know try to improve that bull ratio where the you know those, these mega fires have reduced the canopy cover and and make basically made the bull escapement very tough. Um, <clears throat> next slide. All right, going to the Harney district uh, for elk, and. Um, We'll kind of start off with the Sylvie's unit. So uh, biologists are proposing a fair amount of cuts in the Sylvie's, um, decreasing tags for the any any legal weapon bull one and two by by 75. So 40 in the first season, 35 in the second, um, 100 cow tags in that unit, and then uh, 25 tags in that kind of that North Sylvie's, uh, well, North Juniper Sylvie's cow hunt. Um, the the Sylvie's unit has seen declining hunter success for the past 10 years in all hunts, uh, lack of damage complaints, you know, and bull ratios being below MO since 2019. So just trying to cut tags to, to reverse that trend. Um, however, they're seeing a little bit more increase in elk use in some of that Druzy Valley country. So uh, the Druzy Valley 266 A1 and A2 hunt will be kind of redrawn to include some of the areas where they're seeing some damage elk. Um, and then they're going to increase the tags in that area by 40. Um, so that's just kind of an area where elk have kind of shown up. And then kind of finalizing the North Malheur River, um, looking at decreasing tags from 275 to 250, you know, just 25 uh, tag reduction there. And then um, 25 tag reduction for both Malahi River Bowl um, one and two hunts, which is so basically 50 tags in, in all for that. And again, bull, low bull ratios was kind of the rationale behind the cuts in that in the in that unit. Um, next slide. 
And then kind of finalizing some of the deer and elk stuff, there's been <clears throat> a couple different just youth hunt specific proposals that have come across. Um, so I'll, I'll touch on that right now. So the Warner and the interstate youth deer tags, so the 174T and the 175T, uh, they're going to propose a change of bag limit from one deer to one buck. And basically that's to kind of make um, all the youth hunts in the 100 series all consistent, right? The, it's all going to have the consistent same bag limit, won't be a one deer bag limit. Um, and quite frankly, there's just not a lot of does to you know, to allow folks to be shooting in Eastern Oregon. And so just trying to protect as many does as we can in some of these areas where we're trying to squeeze out recovery for meal deer. Um, what's kind of cool is there's proposals for five uh, new youth buck hunts um, in the Steens, Juniper, Malheur River, Beulah, and Sylvie's units. Um, so basically that's going to be a 20 tags in each of those units. Uh, the season starts five days prior to the any legal weapon season and it runs to the end of that season. So it kind of gives the kids a five day head start um, over their parents or over their brothers or whatever to, to be able to go out and hunt deer. Um, just trying to get some more opportunity for kids to get out there and, and be able to um, you know harvest their first deer. So with elk, um, kind of a couple of changes there. The 241T um, basically increased tags in the White River Hood youth from, from 30 to 40, so just a 10 tag increase there. And then um, for the interstate Silver Lake youth, they added the interstate unit to the Silver Lake youth hunt, kind of combining it. I guess it's, I guess technically it's a new hunt, but you're just combining the interstate unit to the Silver Lake. And then they've been basically increased it by five tags. So it went from 15 to 20. Um, next slide. And then to finalize stuff for me, um, I just wanted to give everyone a, kind of just a reminder. Um, we did a travel management change last year, 2023, went through this same process, solicited comment, went to the commission, got approved, got adopted, um, did the same exact process with the Forest Service, um, the Ochoa National Forest, they approved, they approved this. And so we're basically, um, implementing it right now as a you know starting in here in, a, in about a month um so basically we're extending the the old rager travel management area it's kind of cool it's like a 50-year reunion for this uh this this huge area it's over 350 square miles it's pretty much the entire eastern part of the ochico unit um one of the original uh green dot tmas in oregon and so we're going to extend the dates of it to include uh, both pronghorn and archery seasons so that those road closures will be in effect for all of the um, hunting seasons that will be occurring in the Ochico unit. So August 20th to November 20th, um, we sent all successful uh, pronghorn tag holders and archery tag holders a notice, or they will be getting a notice very soon in the mail alerting them to this change. And we've got these signs, you can see the sign to the left. <clears throat> they, they are basically all up in the points of entry into this unit. And then we're just gonna keep those up year round as opposed to taking them down um, in the winter like we have. So it's basically gonna alert mushroom pickers, uh, you know, woodcutters, people that are recreating on the forest that aren't hunters, that this is an area that there's extended road closures during this time period. Um, sure, there'll be some signs that are going to get shot up, but we'll replace them and just move forward. So um, just want to let folks know that um, I think it's one of the biggest things we can do working with our partners at the Forest Service to increase habitat effectiveness and increase um, some of the things we need to see, right? The buck and bull escapement. Um, these animals need to, you know, not be harassed and, and, and um, I mean, obviously we're harassing them during hunting seasons, but trying to give them as much solitude so that they can, you know, live and keep and, and have as much forage and, and fat reserves as possible and not to get run around all the time. So anyways, that's, that's kind of the end of my talk. I'm going to pass it over right now to uh, John Muir, and he's going to talk about um, pronghorn, bighorn sheep, and um, mountain goat. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Hi, everybody. My name's John. I'm down here in Lake County. I'm the district biologist. And we are here to finish up our presentations with some pronghorn, bighorn sheep, and, and black bear changes. 
Um, as far as pronghorn go on a, on a kind of range wide basis in Oregon, pronghorn really are doing pretty okay across most of the range, especially considering uh, anywhere from four to 10 years worth of extended drought conditions. Um, we did see on average across the desert country above average precipitation this winter and spring. And as Greg indicated, that wasn't enough uh, to significantly affect overwinter survival. Uh, pronghorn in, in most of Oregon are able to move as they need to to escape heavy winter conditions, and, and they certainly did so this past winter. Uh, the good news, though, is that all that precipitation should benefit herd health and, and give us a chance to see some increased recruitment in 2024. Um, as far as changes go, we're really only proposing a couple of things this coming year for 2024. The big one, of course, would be the cancellation of the South Wagon Tire, uh, any legal weapon hunt. Um, really what that's about there is is response to uh, average drought conditions. Over the past decade or more, that South Wagon Tire unit has seen uh, increasingly decreased populations. Hunters have struggled in the real severe drought years to find uh, antelope in that country. Um, and we just felt like it wasn't appropriate to continue to, to offer a hunt out there that uh, that folks were spending 18, 19, could be even 20 preference points to draw with very few antelope on the landscape. Uh, the good news there, though, is that you, that area, that South Wagon Tire hunt area, can still be hunted on the, the unit-wide muzzleloader tag or the unit-wide archery tag. So we, we will still see some opportunity for antelope hunters in that country, um, just not with a rifle. Uh, the other change we're proposing for 2024 is to add uh, 10 tags to that Beulah unit. Um, and that that is a doubling of that of the tags available in that unit, which is which is dramatic. Of course, we're talking low numbers. Uh, and really what that represents is population recovery from a, a really severe winter in 16 and 17. That was that was very hard on them. Uh, next slide, please. For bighorn sheep, we've got several changes here. I'm sure everybody noticed in the in one of the introductory slides that we're overall on a statewide basis looking to add 24 percent to the total number of tags. You'll see here pretty pretty on this slide where a lot of that is coming from. Uh, but uh, across the board, uh, bighorn sheep continue to experience a very mixed bag of results across the range. Really, it's it's kind of a tale of of two of two things. Uh, those populations that have been exposed to domestic sheep and have uh, come down with respiratory diseases, continue to perform very poorly. Um, mycoplasma ovo pneumonia is the primary culprit there, and it's a it's a very real challenge to get that get a population of sheep to recover from an exposure to that bug. Um, in those populations where we've not seen exposure to respiratory diseases, uh, sheep continue to do fairly well. Again, in spite of of some severe drought, it's not ubiquitous across the range. There are subherds that that are struggling um, for for a variety of reasons. But really, uh, those that aren't sick with respiratory diseases continue to do pretty well. And we certainly see that in the John Day populations and the Deschutes populations. And that's reflected with uh, some tag increases here. So uh, the biologists in the in the John Day system are recommending to add a tag to each of those hunts, which will bring it up to eight total tags for each of those hunt periods, representing a really healthy and, and continuously growing population. Uh, in addition to those RAM tags, uh, those biologists are recommending the addition of 15 U tags to bring it up to 25 total. And that's really a special opportunity. It's it's really only been in the past couple of years that, that Oregon hunters have had an opportunity to hunt U's. Um, and we're we're trying very hard to take advantage of not only a, a surplus and opportunity for for harvest there, but we really are, have some concerns biologically about what happens when these sheep populations reach very high levels. What we see is, especially in the young ram component of the population, those rams will wander, and they tend to want to get in trouble with domestic sheep and then return to the population. We don't want to see that happen. So we're we've got some biological concerns with how healthy those populations are. And we're hoping hunters can help us out with that a little bit. Uh, very similar story in the Deschutes. We're adding a tag uh, to each of those hunts, bringing it up to seven total on both sides of the canyon. Next slide, please. And here we see at the top of this slide the, the remainder of the reason for the dramatic increase in bighorn hunting opportunity, uh, again, due to population concerns. Uh, at the high end, we're, we're nervous about those sheep wandering, and so we're going to we're proposing to add eight tags for a total of 15 in that Deschutes population. Again, asking the hunters to help us out a little bit there. Um, moving down into my country a little a little more here, that South Central number two hunt, we're going to propose to add one tag there 
that's purely a reflection of the number of mature rams that, that we've been observing in surveys over the past couple of years. Uh, we see an opportunity there and a couple of those herds that have uh, seem to have, have kind of escaped cougar predation for a moment are, are producing some nice rams, and so we're going to offer that opportunity. Uh, basically, a similar story with Riverside. An addition of one tag there brings it up to two. That herd has been recovering over the past, oh, I'd say, six or eight years. And we just returned to hunting that population a year or two ago. And so we continue to see that herd recover well. And we're trying to add some extra opportunity there. Next slide, please. Of course, in the, the old high desert region, we don't have any mountain goat hunts, uh, though we do have a population of mountain goats as a result of a reintroduction into the Cascades uh, centered around Mount Jefferson. That population has continued to perform fairly well or is at least stabilizing. Uh, there was some some concern for sure around the 2021 lion's head fire, um, but those those mountain goats have essentially seemed to have escaped dramatic impacts from the fire and are now starting to feed in that burn scar, which is great to see. Uh, in terms of black bear, we've only got one proposed change for the controlled hunt program in this part of the world. Uh, we're looking to add 50 tags and to go from 450 to 500 total tags for that south central uh, spring black bear hunt. And that's purely a reflection of, a, of an increasing population, a population that's been increasing for something like 25 or 30 years. Um, we continue to see very, very low harvest rates in that South Central spring hunt, uh, but certainly see the evidence for, for plenty of opportunity. Um, next slide, please. With that, I'll hand it back to Tucker. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you, John. So that more or less concludes our preset presentation portion of the meeting tonight. Um, once again, I'll just, just set up the reminder uh, to utilize that QR code to continue to provide us feedback or, or ask questions. Uh, it looks like we may have a little more time than we than we first thought to, to run through these, and maybe we can get to them all tonight, but, uh, but you're more than welcome to continue to utilize that or, or go to myodfw.com. And, and search 2024 big game regulations to uh, to provide feedback that way as well. Um, I'll just uh, you know give another reminder that that tonight's feedback will be shared with the commission. Um, and again, that commission meeting is set for uh, September 15th this year in Bend. Um, you're always welcome to go testify in person or do so virtually. Um, or you can send an email uh, in the time between now and and that uh, September 15th date. Uh, to the email address listed at the bottom of your screen. Um, at this point, I think we are set to break in. We'll hand it over to Michelle Dennehy, um, and we should be able to break into our, our Q&A session in a live format. So take it from here, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Uh, we just have a couple high desert specific questions. So the first one is for Lee Foster. Uh, Mason says, um, I spend a lot of time in the Malheur unit, um, and he has concerns about the Malheur River deer hunt. Um, he's seen a decline in buck numbers and uh, wonders, you know, should the tag numbers be lowered? So maybe you can address that, Lee. Sure. Thanks, Michelle. And thank you for the question, Mason. Hopefully you're on the, uh, the webinar. Um, yeah, so we've got a few things going on with Malheur River, um, you know, that are that are not necessarily unique, but specific to that area. Um, the most recent factor affecting that herd um, was the winter of 1617 uh, that John mentioned, alluded to in, in relation to some pronghorn numbers. Um, during that winter, we saw, you know, 30% of our adults die, essentially all of our fawns. Um, and the population as a whole crash pretty hard. Um, you know, since that time, we figured that that the population in Malheur River is now about a 33% or so lower than it was before that winter. Um, however, you know, we take all that into account when we're setting tags. So at, across the same time period, we've reduced tags by more than 40%, um, rifle tags by more than 40%. So 
you know, with those reductions in rifle tags and with the shift to um, to controlled archery in that unit, we've seen harvest decline quite a bit. Um, and our buck ratio has actually come up to, uh, to you know, well above management objective um, or management objective for the units 15. At the same time, too, we've also seen our uh, hunter success numbers come up quite a bit, too, since uh, the winter 16, 17. We're now back up to close to 50 percent hunter success in the unit as of last year which is you know about where it was in 2010 so you know there the total herd health in the unit isn't stellar but we're managing to you know maintain our buck ratios in our hunter success which allows us to you know allow a little bit more opportunity thank you okay thank you lee now here's a question about the fort rock unit from bryant um, he hunts that unit, uh, and he's noticed a decline in deer populations, especially buck. Is there any talk of changing allocated tags? So this could be for any of the biologists that deal with the Fort Rock unit, maybe John or Tom. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to answer that, Michelle. Um, the Fort Rock unit is a challenging one for sure. Um, that's a unit where we've seen some really dramatic changes in terms of what the hunters experience in early October, especially in that in that any any legal weapon season. Um, and of course, you know, as we're talking about mule deer, as we all know, and we've discussed that populations continue to decline across the board in most units, and we certainly see that in Fort Rock as well. Uh, I attribute most of the lack of hunter success, honestly, to to forest conditions uh, and the lack of visibility. I think. That's a unit where we see a lot of a lot of family tradition, a lot of a lot of folks returning year after year to the same spot. And I think as folks look back on pictures that that may be in the file cabinet somewhere of grandpa or or even even mom and dad uh, a generation ago hunting that country, it looked very different. Um, uh, forest management has changed dramatically in the last several decades, and it's had a very real effect on um, not only habitat conditions and and growing deer, but but what a hunter experiences in terms of being able to find them. Uh, I hope that helps answer the question a little bit. Thanks for thanks for sending it. Okay, thank you, John. Now, a number of our other questions are more general in nature, not specific to the high desert, but Tucker, maybe you can help with this one. Lance says, um, I would like to see crossbow use legal for disabled people that can't draw a bow anymore. And we've got some history with crossbows and our commission, so maybe you can talk about that. Yeah. So, so briefly, you know, we do offer a draw lock option for compound bows for, for people with disabilities. Um, you know, the, the truth of this is that, that this question's come up multiple times um, throughout the years. It's, it's gone to the commission level multiple times and multiple times it has not been implemented. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to say that we can't value that input. We do. Um, but it's probably going to be a tough road to hoe. Um, it's probably going to take a bigger movement of some sort to to convince the commission, which are that that is the decision making authority um, for ODFW uh, to put that through and 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 allow crossbow use uh, in the state. Okay, and this is really our last question, and we haven't received too many about the high desert. Um, this one could be a good one for John Muir. Um, we had a, another John say that he'd like to see hunters able to use dogs to hunt mountain lions. So maybe you could just review the history of, of that hunting structure. Yeah, thanks for that question, John. It's it's something that we think about a lot as managers. It's something that we all think about as hunters. It's it's a question that we get a lot. And I think really the the way to the way to begin to understand where we're at is to back up a little in time. Uh, in 1994, uh, Oregon passed a, a ballot measure called Ballot Measure 18 that was voted on by the citizens of Oregon and passed by a fair margin. And what that did was was ban the use of hounds for the hunting of cougar and bear. Um, since that time, over 30 years now has passed. Uh, there's been, as certainly in the time that I've been watching, uh, close to, uh, well, better than 15 years now, every legislative session, there's been a bill proposed, introduced, either sponsored by ODFW or crafted by groups like Oregon Hunters Association that we have supported uh, to try and return that, that tool to our tool bag, uh, to try and regain an opportunity for hunters to take advantage of, of opportunity in the state. Um, obviously, because we're still in a place where we do not have authority to use hounds for hunting, 
uh, those those efforts have not have not gone well. Um, I will say that I think it's worth noting at least that ultimately in asking the legislature to overturn that ballot measure, what we're doing is asking the legislature to to overturn the, the what the voters declared in 94. And after 30 years, that may well be appropriate, but it, it does seem to me to represent a bit of a slippery slope. So just know that the authority currently is not within our ability. We have a limited tool on cougar target areas that we can implement in very specific situations. Um, but right now, if change is if change is appropriate and if change is desired by the Oregon public and the Oregon hunters, they got to be talking to their legislators. Thanks for the question, John. All right, well, that's really all I have. If anyone is watching and has a question, please feel free to use that form and we can respond offline. But just wanted to thank everyone for coming and watching the webinar tonight. Again, uh, our, the Fish and Wildlife Commission will adopt re regulations September 15th and bend. So if you have something to say about what you saw tonight, um, you're welcome to go in person to that meeting to testify. And there's also the option to testify remotely. Uh, you can under at odfw.com under the commission page, uh, there is a way to register to testify remotely, which you'll, you need to do 48 in, hours in advance of the meeting. So uh, thank you again for coming to the webinar. And again, uh, you'll hear after the commission meeting on, on September 15th, what was adopted. Thank you. Thank you.